Okay, thank you all for coming. I'm uh, happy to see that the room is so packed. Um, if this is your first time attending the session, we, uh, we give a similar session at every KubeCon. Uh, naturally, there are a lot of updates to get people up to speed with. Uh, but if this, uh, if this is your first time, um, this is a pretty laid back session. Um, we're just gonna talk a little bit about Linkerd, about service meshes, what's been happening, where are we going? And uh, I hope that I'll finish in due time so at the end you can ask me a bunch of questions. So please prepare questions, otherwise we're gonna have to sit in awkward silence. Um, I don't think, I don't like that. I don't, I don't wanna do that, so um, yeah. Uh, before we start, just so I know what to talk about, can I have a quick show of hands for people who heard about service meshes before? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, anyone here ever used Istio in production? All right, what about Linkerd? Where are the Linkerd droids? All right, all right. Cool, uh, last question, I promise, and then I'll start. Uh, anyone here ever needed to do circuit breaking in production? Okay, well, you're in for a treat. A little bit about myself, my name is Mate. I'm one of the maintainers uh, for Linkerd. I'm a software engineer at Buoyant. Um, I've been involved with the project for over three years now. I started as a mentee for a community uh, program sponsored by the CNCF. And uh, since then I've been uh, working on it full time. If you wanna get in contact with me after the talk is over, you can uh, find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm also on GitHub. You can't really talk to me on GitHub, but you can tag me and I'll, I'll try to respond. Uh, and finally, I'm also in a couple of Slack workspaces. Uh, you see the Linkerd Slack here, but I'm also in the CNCF one and the Kubernetes one. I don't think there are a lot of Mate Davids around, so I, I think you're gonna have a, an easy time finding me. Uh, but yeah, that's a picture of me, so in case it wasn't obvious. Cool. Um, Linkerd is a different kind of service mesh. Um, it's an ultra light, ultra simple, uh, easy to use service mesh. We've been in production for a large number of years. Ignore the slide. It's a, four plus years, but it's more on the plus side. Uh, we have a very vibrant community. Um, we like to help each other out. The Slack channel in particular has been my starting point with the community. And uh, if you're not there, I, I really encourage you to join. Um, yeah, we have a bunch of companies that adopted Linkerd. Uh, you can see some of them here. And we're also the only CNCF graduated service mesh. But I think the takeaway from the slide is that Linkerd is a service mesh. So what is a service mesh? I feel like for the people who didn't raise their hands, uh, you might think it's a very complex tool. Um, definitely in the industry, it's been associated with complexity. And I think that's a little bit unfair um, because basically a service mesh is just a platform level tool that's giving you a bunch of goodies out of the box. You get observability, um, you know, you get service level golden metrics, uh, protocol level metrics, such as HTTP success rates, uh, you get service topologies. You get a lot of reliability features, you know, a bunch of abstractions, uh, traffic routing, traffic shaping, retries, timeouts, load balancing, and you get security. Uh, MTLS out of the box, authorization policies. And the reason why I say it's unfair to tie it down with complexity and to associate it with complexity is because all of you probably at some point had to do one of these things in your applications. And doing all of these things in your applications across different stacks is much more complex than just managing another tool in your production environment. Now, Linkerd itself, as a service mesh, is focused on simplicity. That's kind of a core philosophy of ours. We don't wanna be just simple to contribute to, we also wanna be simple to use. Now, the way service meshes work in general, oh, that's a loud door. Um, the way service meshes work in general, and this is not kind of exclusive to Linkerd, um, all of them kind of use a similar model. You have a control plane that you deploy in your Kubernetes cluster, and then you have a data plane. Um, we use a sidecar proxy for a data plane. It's something that we've built purposely for Linkerd. Um, and uh, it's written in Rust. Um, for those of you who don't know, Rust is the new up and coming language, and it has no CVEs. <coughs> C++, oops, spoilers again. Uh, it's ultra fast. I keep going to the next slide. It's ultra fast, ultra light, and it's built on a state-of-the-art network stack. So a bunch of my former and current colleagues contributed to the libraries that power Linkerd and power much of the Rust community now. So Tokyo is the asynchronous runtime. Hyper is the HTTP library that most people use and, and build on top of. And uh, Tower is a very fundamental networking library in Rust. 
Now with us in our proxy, uh, we consider it to be, like, philosophically speaking, we consider it to be an implementation detail. You shouldn't have to worry about the proxy, right? You shouldn't have to be an expert. You shouldn't have to know how to write Rust, how Rust works and how the proxy itself works. Because at the end of the day, Kubernetes gives you enough headaches. So what we want to do with Linkerd is alleviate these headaches. We want you to actually have a good night's sleep and not be woken up at 2 a.m. to fix stuff. Now, a common question that we used to get, uh, now it's eBPF, but I'm sure someone will ask me by the end of this presentation. A common question that we get is, how does Linkerd differ from all of the other service meshes out there? I think, you know, obviously you have to take everything with a grain of salt because you're talking to a Linkerd maintainer. So I'm going to tell you that Linkerd is the best. It's, uh, you know, the only choice out there, um, but that's not entirely true. It's very dependent on your environment. I would boil it down to kind of the philosophical stances and approaches that we have to, that we have to our applications and the way we develop things and the way we want things to work. For one, uh, service meshes that are built on Envoy cater to a wide variety of use cases. Philosophically speaking, we you know just want to stay in our corner, uh, make it simpler to use, and a lot of the times that means not having a wide configuration area for you to mess around with. I would also say that Linkerd gives you less foot guns. I mean, you know, you don't have a lot of configuration. There are less places that you can mess up, and we're very opinionated with the way that we do things. But at the end of the day, it is just a philosophical approach. If you need feature parity, if you need a lot of feature, then you need to look at something like Envoy, which is a bit more bloated. Uh, we like to do things a bit different. Now, looking back at the past year, um, I think around this time when I gave this talk in Valencia, we were around Linkerd 2.11, and that's when we introduced authorization policies. Um, so with authorization policies, the problem is a little bit flipped on its head because you don't have a lot of primitives that you can actually leverage uh, to you know, build all of the APIs that you want to build. And, um, Basically, the service object in Kubernetes, which is already super overloaded, cannot be used at all for authorization policies, right? There's no way for you as a server to know which client connected to you and which, well, sorry, which service the client that connected to you used or if they even use the service at all, right? You just get a connection. And based on that, you want to have an expressive way and a powerful way to express fine-grained authorization policies. So in Linkerd 2.11, we rolled our own CRD uh, server authorizations that um, basically selected a bunch of ports uh, on your workloads and allowed you to have these fine-grained authorization policies per port. And as part of Linkerd 2.11, we also introduced some other things such as gRPC retries. Um, when you have HTTP uh, POST requests that have bodies, uh, well, most of them have bodies, but when you, uh, when you have to do retries with them, the problem is a bit hard because you have to buffer all of these requests in memory. So how do you ensure that you don't get um killed? And uh, for us, believe it or not, it was even with Rust that doesn't actually introduce any CVEs and lets you manage memory in a very efficient way. Uh, even for us, it was a problem that, you know, we kind of banged our head against the wall for a while to fix. Uh, but in 2.11, we shipped it. You have a 64 kilobyte uh, max payload that you can, uh, you can put in. And aside from that, we also made some performance adjustments. We wanted the proxy footprint to be even uh, smaller than it currently is. And on average, I think we have like a 10 megabytes overhead. Um, and we also reduced the control plane down to just free deployments because we thought a lot of the stuff that we have in there is unnecessary. So we, we tried to slim it down and, and package it in a different way. I think kind of looking back, 2.11 was very feature packed. Uh, we also added uh, multi-cluster headless support. So if you want to talk to just one instance across clusters, you can do that. You can just mirror the headless service. You can create the DNS records, and it all just works. Uh, we added fuzz testing, which is not very much a, a user feature, but it's kind of cool to say. Um, and we also added CLI tab completion. And uh, in this very detailed diagram, you can see how authorization is supposed to work. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. Also, in Linkerd 2.11, we extended Rust to the control plane, uh, which was a very major milestone for us because prior to that, the control plane was fully written in Go. Uh, so for those of you who are kind of new to Linkerd, uh, the control plane is made up of a couple of uh, deployments. We have a destination service that we use for service discovery. So we kind of like cache endpoints and serve them to the proxy. Uh, we have an identity component that lets each proxy generate its own certificate. Uh, it has a maximum bound of 24 hours, but it depends on its issuer. And then we have a proxy injector, which is a mutating webhook server that basically lets you add the sidecar proxies without having to do any work. You just add an annotation to your workload. 
um, and then it will get the sidecar proxy in any configuration that you set for the proxy. But then we also added a policy container, uh, and this policy container is supposed to discover these server authorizations policies that we that we introduced. By the way, uh, writing Rust is always good, and writing the control plane in Rust and introducing more Rust has been a breeze for us. It's been uh, it's been pretty fun so far. Um, but I don't want to digress too much. In Linkerd 2.12, we introduced per route policy. So one thing that we noticed with authorization policies in general is that, okay, you have them scoped per port, but you want to be even finer grained than that. When you have liveness check, when you have a readiness check, when you have maybe a metrics endpoint that you want to expose to multiple consumers, having something tied to a port doesn't make a lot of sense. So we, uh, we wanted to kind of, you know, find a different approach to this and, and let users have a little bit more control. And you'll see that that's one of the kind of trends that we're going to. We, we want to give more and more control uh, by limiting, again, the foot guns that we also provide you. Uh, so in 2.12, we borrowed the HTTP route resource from the Gateway API, uh, but we put it into our own group so we can, you know, take some things out and, um, you know, add some things and not be fully spec compliant. And in this picture, you can see picture, diagram, whatever. Um, you can see how the HTTP route resource kind of looks like. You attach it to, uh, to a server. A server is a construct that we use in Linkerd to say which ports a workload exposes. Um, and then you can add uh, the endpoints that you want the request to match on and then tie an authorization policy to it. So an authorization policy, uh, when you have it like per route, is associated with one or more servers and it allows you to have this fine grain controlled. Authorization policy is also the new resource that we came up with to uh, replace server authorization uh, because we just realized that, you know, we, we want to do things in a more Kubernetes gateway API uh, way. And uh, I probably forgot to mention this at the, at the start of the slide, but one good thing with the gateway API is that it introduces this pattern called policy attachment that allows you to basically create resources that configure other resources. So instead of having to rely on annotations, which to be honest, when you start using them can a little bit disgusting in prod uh, and you know you don't have a lot of visibility into them um, so instead of using annotations you use actual typed resources that you can then attach to other resources to configure them hope that makes sense if not you know add that to the list of questions cool what's new and let me check my time a little bit because i also want to give a demo so all right we're good so what's new? Uh, Linkerd 2.13 released two weeks ago, and we've been working on it for, uh, for a few months. Um, we had, at the moment when 2.12 was, was releasing, we had kind of like a vague idea of what we want to do. Um, and we thought about the gateway API, and we thought about the HTTP route resource, and the fact that now you can have more expressive authorization policies. So naturally, the next point for us was, when are we going to extend this to client policies as well? The HTTP route is a great resource to kind of leverage uh, Kubernetes native primitives to, to express a bunch of configuration without introducing additional types. And that's exactly what we did. In 2.13, we uh, started to move away from service profiles. And uh, for those of you who, uh, who are kind of new to Linkerd, service profiles are like a resource that we use to basically do a bunch of uh, resiliency configurations, such as timeouts and retries, and you know, you kind of scope them to a service. Uh, and we started moving away from that because instead of maintaining our own type, we can maintain an HTTP route type that's shared uh, with your ingress, that's you know shared with other components that might be able to use it. In other words, we wanted to kind of converge on an interop layer uh, that's going to make it easier for you to manage all of your configuration. The good thing about HTTP routes is that they provide you with a very native way to do dynamic request routing, so traffic splitting. Uh, if any of you ever had to do traffic splitting and you're familiar with the SMI spec, the SMI spec was you know, kind of abandoned a year or so ago. There wasn't really much happening there, um, but with HTTP routes, you can do traffic splitting. You have a parent reference that you attach the route to and then backends that you forward the request to. Um, you can also do header-based routing now with Linkerd and with the HTTP route. You can say when a request matches a specific header, send it to, the, to, the, to this backend. So what I'm trying to say is that by kind of introducing the HTTP route resource, we started getting a more native approach to traffic splitting. And finally, and this is, you know, I'm kind of looping in on, on my question uh, before I started, we introduced circuit breaking. Uh, and this was a huge milestone for us. You know, you can hold the applause until the end, but it was a huge milestone for us. 
um, because a lot of people requested it. Um, I think when I started three years ago, uh, someone wrote a proposal for circuit breaking, and he, he wasn't even the first person to do it. Um, so we finally added, in Linkerd, we refer to it as failure accrual. And uh, before I kind of go deeper, does anyone here not know what circuit breaking actually mean? I can explain it, please don't be shy. Okay, yeah, we've ha we have a few hands raised. So circuit breaking is this pattern for uh, failure resiliency um, that you kind of consider in a load balancer. So it, it ties in with other load balancer policies. Um, and you basically say, when you have a group of endpoints and one of them returns successive errors, you don't want to keep forwarding requests to that endpoint. You want to take it out of circulation. You want to let it you know, cool off for a bit, put it in a corner, send your request somewhere else. And when that endpoint is ready, usually apply a back off period and you kind of periodically poke it. When that endpoint is ready, you bring it back into the fold. Um, so this helps you manage your load. Um, we also, oops, spoiler. Um, we also introduced in the proxy a few more layers of load shedding and you know in-memory buffering and uh, all of the nerdy stuff that people usually like when when they look at the proxy code. Um, in 2.13, we also started messing around. So we introduced a whole new API, a whole new discovery API that's part of the policy controller. Uh, and part of what we wanted to do is you know have a nice way to configure the proxy moving forward. So circuit breaking through failure accrual was the first step. Uh, but the next step will be to, you know, let you configure fail fast timeouts. Uh, if you've used Linkerd before, you might know that fail fast timeouts are, uh, are an error users always run into, and they're, you know, it's a bit scary because out of nowhere you just get like a fail fast timeout when you cannot connect. It's basically circuit breaking at the load balancer level, um, and we're going to make it a bit more configurable. We're going to let you configure the in-memory buffer. We're going to let you configure queues and, and all of that stuff. So again, kind of offering more and more knobs that you can use to. Um, to make sure that you know, Linkerd is right for you. And finally, as uh, part of 2.13, we started being involved with the uh, Gateway API for mesh management and administration. It's a mouthful. Uh, that's why we call it Gamma. That's you know kind of the, the name we settled on. It also sounds cool, easier to say. Um, and Gamma is a subset of the Gateway API. It's a bunch of people that want to see how the Gateway API can actually, um, can actually apply to mesh use cases. So we're, we're kind of driving together with other uh, service meshes in the industry. We're kind of driving this effort of having more standardization and uh, figuring out what to do with the resources such as HTTP routes. Cool. And uh, now I'm going to try and do a demo. Uh, I've never done a demo during these talks. So let's, let's see if it goes well. Um, can you all see the screen? Can you read the text? OK, cool. So I'm going to be demonstrating how failure accrual works. Uh, and believe it or not, when you're on stage, it's much harder to do a demo, in case that was not obvious. Cool. So first, we'll, we'll have a look at the uh, demo application. I actually just have it running in the browsers he browser here. It's called Faces. It basically just displays um, smiley faces. And uh, when you see it being green, it generally means the request was a su success. When it's red, there was a service error. Uh, when it's sleeping, it's a timeout, so on and so forth. Over here, we see the pods that we're actually hitting from the GUI. So the GUI sends requests, displays them here, and then sends them to this, to this pod. Uh, and we're going to see in just a little bit when we introduce failure how circuit breaking actually works in practice. So first, we get the pods. Everything's running. Um, Currently, failure accrual in Linkerd. I guess I should have talked a little bit more about this. Uh, but yeah, circuit breaking is done through failure accrual. Um, you can do circuit breaking in a number of different ways, but we chose to go with failure accrual. And right now, we only support max failure accrual. So that means cons max consecutive failure for failure accrual. Uh, that's a mouthful. Try saying that three times fast. Um, what that means, basically, is that you can set a, a max number of requests that will fail. And when those requests fail, you trip the breaker for that endpoint. Um, what I'm showing on screen is just how to configure the max consecutive failures, but you can also set the penalty for it. Like, what, what back off strategy do you want? What jitter factor do you want? Um, so to kind of demonstrate, we, uh, we have a, the same app here, another deployment. Uh, and you'll see that it has a 100% error fraction. So all of the requests that go to this, to this other deployment, 
um, are going to instantly fail. So we're going to have a service, select both deployments, the one that I showed you before, where we actually return successes, and one that only returns failures. So I'm going to apply that. I'm not typing this out, by the way. It's a recorded demo. I've learned my lesson. So now if I flip back, we're going to start seeing um, some of the requests fail. I'm going to wait a little bit more just so you can get the hang of it. All right, that's enough. Cool. Right now, um, circuit breaking is configured only through um, annotations. Um, and that's because in order for us to provide like a more structured way, uh, we need to, to wait a little bit and see, you know, kind of how the community feels about it, where we want to, where we want to go with this. So, you know, expect point releases and, you know, future releases to, to expand on this a little bit more. But for now, annotations on a service will do. So the, the basic idea is you, uh, you have a target, you have a service and you want to say, okay, for this service, configure the load balancer policy, configure circuit breaking. We add this annotation, the changes should be picked up immediately. And uh, after a while, we set the, I think, um, consecutive failure limit to like 30 there. So after 30 fail requests from when I apply the annotation, uh, we should see the breaker trip. And the endpoint is taken out of circulation. So now it's again all successes because we don't consider the endpoint anymore. Occasionally, um, you know, the backoff period will, will elapse and we're going to send a request through. The request still fails, so the endpoint is still sitting in its corner. And that's kind of the gist of it. Sorry, I'm not, it's a very anticlimactic ending to it, but... Cool, where are my slides? All right. So we, uh, we had a look at what we've been up to in 2.14. Uh, I know my voice doesn't you know, uh, have a lot of excitement in it, but I'm super excited because it, it took us a lot of work to get here. So I hope all of you are excited and kind of ready to play with it. But um, maybe a question that you're going to have, and if you don't have it, I'm going to impose it on you now, is what's next? Like, what, what are we going to be working on next? We have a very ambitious plan for 2.14 and beyond. Um, first of all, in the very near future, uh, we need to adopt more of the extra resources that come out of the Gateway API. The Gateway API itself has been, you know, seeing um, a lot of, you know, new contributions, and it's seeing, you know, more of a stable. Na it's in more stable state now. Uh, but we uh, we want to adopt more routes when the time is right. So um, we want to introduce gRPC circuit breaking through, um, you know, dedicated uh, annotations. We want to do policy attachment for a bunch of the load balancer policy. Uh, we also want to adopt probably at some point TCP routes and, and let you do all of this native traffic splitting for gRPC and um, TCP and, and so on and so forth. Uh, up next, I kind of mentioned this in passing throughout the presentation. We want to have finer grained proxy configuration, so even more knobs for you to twist. Um, and that kind of extends to the load balancer policy. Right now we're doing um, Yuma, uh, which is estimated weighted moving average. Um, it's a type of load balancer policy that relies on the power of two choices. So whenever you have like two endpoints that you compare, you take the one with the least latency and just kind of go on and on and on. But for some people, this, this doesn't seem to do the trick, right? And for a very long time, we, you know, being as opinionated as we are, so like, oh, this is probably going to be enough. But sometimes, you know, no two environments are the same and no two environments are created equally. So if it's important for people to have this configuration, we kind of reached a point where we're like, well, okay, let's, let's do it. And we're finally in a good place where uh, our API is, um, is designed in such a way to support this uh, at an even bigger scale. The last three ones are super exciting for me personally because I know a lot of people have asked about them. I've been, I've been working the, the booth in the past two days. That's why my voice is raspy and my eyes just kind of stare out. It's been a lot of work. Um, but mesh expansion, this is something that people have been asking for a very long time. You want to run Linkerd with your EC2 instances, maybe, or you have like a hybrid kind of architecture where you want to use a mix of both. Uh, this is going to be possible in the very near future. Uh, ingress. This might come as a bit of a shock. Like, what does he mean by ingress? Well, we want to roll out our own ingress controller. It's, uh, you know, Linkerd, in case you're not aware, uh, works with any ingress controller that you have out there, as long as you have a pod in the cluster to kind of inject the sidecar proxy in. Uh, but the next point for us after adopting the gateway API and after hearing users' requests was to 
to think through our own implementation of, uh, of Ingress and the Gateway API, and all something that people can use so you have a unified stack. And of course, once you handle the Ingress side, you also have to handle the egress side. And I know, again, a lot of people want to do external connections, maybe have a connection to a database, you want to get in metrics in, you want to do MTLS, all of this stuff we're going to handle with egress. And now comes the fun part. Um, this is more of a call to action. Um, I don't know how many of you here are in the Slack channel, how many of you ever contributed, but we're a very friendly bunch. So, um, you know, all of our development is done on GitHub. Uh, everything is open sourced. If you want to look at anything, you know, definitely hit us up. I, I see a few of you here that I've seen contribute. So, um, you know, makes my heart grow when that happens. Um, we also have uh, formal announcements and mailing lists on CNCF, so if that's your thing and you, you like to receive your uh, newsletter and emails, uh, we're always going to publish those, especially when we do releases. We also have formal third-party security audits, um, so yeah, if you, if you have any doubts about our security practices, you shouldn't, but if you have any doubts about our security practices, we have some third-party audits that have been, uh, that have been done. And finally, we also rolled out a support forum. So uh, one thing with Slack, I've been on Slack for a very long time, is that um, you know the history is just not preserved. Sometimes it's hard to search for issues. So uh, we rolled out a forum. Um, people can post in there. You know, if you have any um, articles you want to write, or if you have any questions that you want to ask, yeah, it's all in there. And finally, we also run a monthly hands-on engineering focus training uh, to get you up to speed. You know, a lot of people again say it's complex. I beg to differ, again, also very biased. I work on it day to day, um, but that's why we, we kind of want to help you be successful. And if you want to run Linkerd easier on any Kubernetes cluster, uh, Buoyant, the creator of Linkerd, also has a SaaS product to help you out. And finally, my favorite part, questions. Yeah, should I just give the mic out? How does this work? All right, he's got the mic. I'll let you pick. Thanks. Thanks for the, all the nice new features. Um, the API gateway spec with the HP route seems to be very tightly coupled to having a gateway, which kind of sounds like ingress. How does it work between multiple services in the same mesh? Yeah, that's a really good question. So you're correct. The Gateway API was supposed to standardize some of the Ingress stuff, and it's mostly for north-south traffic. Um, and that's why we came up with this whole gamma movement to kind of standardize the resources for east-west traffic, for mesh traffic. Um, we're, we're working on it. Uh, we have all of the people who work on service meshes in general, whether they're Linkerd proxy based, Envoy based, uh, you know, kind of adapt the HTTP route resources to make it make sense. Um, but yeah, the gateway resource, for example, is not something we use in mesh, but the X route resources are because they allow you to shape traffic and do all of this dynamic request routing stuff. Does that answer your question? Okay, so if I use the HTTP route resource or type, it will already work in the mesh yeah. between peers. No, yeah, swear. as long as you attach it to a service that, you know, is meshed. Right. Yeah. Thanks. No problems. Yeah, keep them coming. Hello. Um, so with the circuit breaking, what if all of my pods start throwing errors all at once? Do they all get taken out of circulation or is there some kind of like percentage maximum out of circulation thing going on? Uh, a very good question. If all of your pods start returning 500 errors all at once, they're all going to be taken out of circulation and they're all going to be, you know, apply the uh, back off penalty. Um, so if one of them comes back on, we're going to probe it. If it does, we're going to start routing requests to it. Otherwise, you know, tough luck. Keep them coming. Okay, we've got one more at the back. I'm getting ready for the eBPF question at some point. Um, thanks for the presentation. I just wanted to ask, um, are you supporting IP version 6? No, not yet. That's a very good point. Um, we don't. It's in the books, though, um, if you want to speed up the process. So we know a bunch of people started adopting dual stack. Um, 
it's not trivial to implement it. You have the IP tables layer. Um, we have a few more changes to make because some of our, you know, we use IPv4 by default in a proxy. Um, it's not trivial, but it's something that we can do. We just need to see how much of the community is currently moving to dual stack to kind of know how to prioritize it and, and what direction to move in. So um, if you want to use IPv6, there's an issue open in the GitHub repo. Just go on there and, and tag me and, and bug other people and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get it on the roadmap. Cool, thanks. No more questions? Come on. I need at least two more. Is HTTP 3 support coming in soon? Uh, no. Ah. No, sorry. That was a, it was a quick, quick answer, but it's not, it's not on the books for now. Um, again, if you think you have a use case, so this is something that we generally tell people. Um, if you think you have a good use case for it, we're super happy to have a chat. Um, but again, we aim to be super simple in the stuff that we do. So everything has to be thought out and kind of passed through our own opinionated filter. So, you know, it helps to have an issue. It helps to track it and it helps to see uh, how many people want to have it done. Got it. One more. Um, you hinted it uh, kind of already, uh, EPPF uh, side colors, uh, what's your stance? Okay, thank you for finally asking. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, okay, again, this is my opinion, right, as the maintainer, so it's not even, you know, the opinion of my colleagues. I, I like EPPF. I think it's a very cool technology. I think being able to have all of this observability built in the kernel is super cool. There's a bit cut, bi uh, a big but coming. Um, I think the big problem with eBPF is that you cannot actually do any state management inside of it. The verifier is super strict. You cannot have unbounded loops. There's not a lot of stuff that you can do in there. eBPF really sparkles when you need like tracing, when you need packet tracing, when you need to do socket level load balancing. All of this stuff is cool. But as soon as you start abstracting things away and you need to do stuff like uh, circuit breaking or when you need to do stuff like retries, when you need to do stuff like timeouts, you can't really do that with eBPF. And that's why even the service mesh solutions that kind of run a mix of eBPF and something else, they usually use Envoy to kind of handle all of this layer 7 stuff. Um, so I think eBPF is cool. We support eBPF CNIs if you want to use you know, Calico or whatever else, Cilium, you can, you can go ahead and use it. Uh, Linkerd supports it. Uh, but when it comes to doing service mesh things, which is failure resiliency, observability at a higher level, you know, that's protocol related. Um, and when you want to do MTLS, then, you know, no substitute for the sidecar proxy. Thank you. <laughs>